So I wanted to take a, a, an evolutionary perspective here and think about the evolution of cooperation and the evolution of us. So I think by, I'm really going to take you through about 5 million years of human history in about 25 minutes, so it'll be, a, it'll be brisk. Um, so uh, now, uh, Ricardo had mentioned um, economics, so homo economicus. But I think one of the problems with that approach is that it, it really departs from uh, Enlightenment philosophy or 19th century philosophy. So what I try to do in my book here is uh, develop an approach to evolution and human behavior that takes an evolutionary approach. So the, the, point, the place I want to depart from is um, that humans are an ape. So you can actually understand quite a bit about humans if you just recognize we're a kind of ape. Things about status and competition, especially amongst males. Uh, mating or avoiding inbreeding, uh, inbreeding uh, what we're afraid of, mothering, things like that. So you can actually make a lot of progress. But of course, we're a special type of ape. So we're a cultural species. We're heavily reliant on acquiring information from other members of our social group. We acquire uh, such a massive amount of knowledge that we can't even survive if we place us in a world where we have to survive as hunter-gatherers. So unlike other species, we don't know how to find food or make shelter or survive without fire. We can't survive on raw food. Now, this has given rise to a process that's made our evolution different from other species. So we're a, a species created by culture gene coevolution. So many aspects of our physiology, biology, hormones, and psychology are a product of the interaction of these, of these two different inheritance systems. Now, one of the key things that our ability to learn from others, our cultural capacities, gives rise to is social norms. So I think a lot of the things that have puzzled economists is because we're a species that evolved in a world with social norms. So these are rules that specify what you're supposed to do, but they also specify how others will judge you. And so this will emerge spontaneously. Once we can learn from each other, we can learn both what we're supposed to do in a, search, a situation, um, not eat a certain kind of food, like a food taboo, and then how we judge others, the standards for judging others. You're a bad person. If you don't eat that food, we're not going to associate with you. And that creates these self-reinforcing stable equilibria that just arise through social learning. But one of the key aspects of our psychology that's evolved in this process is we internalize social norms. So they become goals in themselves. So this is one of the ways we can endogenize preferences and explain how it is that preferences can evolve through time. And some of the, uh, m some of the main findings of the revolution that Ricardo talked about turn out to be just the peculiar psychology of Westerners, the subjects most commonly used in experiments. So I'm going I'm to tear apart some of that diversity in a few minutes. Um, norms can be arbitrary. So we can learn to uh, have food taboos on arbitrary food. We can have crazy um, norms like wearing cloth around your neck and strangling yourself. I haven't worn a tie in a long time. Um, but the most powerful norms are um, those that are anchored on aspects of our evolved psychology. So there are features of being an ape and also features of our evolved psychology that have developed since we split with chimpanzees that provide firm anchors for certain kinds of norms. I'm going to be talking about some of those. Now, economists often talk about institutions, but if you push economists, which is one of my favorite hobbies, uh, to, to, to tell you what an institution is, there's a lot of backpedaling. They're not really sure what it is. It seems to be a top-down phenomenon almost. So from this perspective, you can get institutions as packages of social norms. They're partially internalized, so they're goals in themselves. And then on top of that, you can come to understand what formal institutions are as opposed to informal institutions. So something like marriage, it's a set of rules that regulate our pair bonding psychology. There's rules about how many spouses you can have, the roles and responsibilities of each member, where you have to live after you get married, and who pays who at the wedding. Um, also all variable across societies, but it was only later that we put uh, laws on it. Now, I think all, one of the other unrecognized things is that as these institutions, packages of social norms emerge, our brains actually respond in ways that make us better at navigating these culturally constructed worlds, the worlds made up of institutions. And I'll show you some data on that. Now, these anchors I mentioned, these things that make norms really sticky, uh, these first three you can find in other apes. So they're kind of very deep. So uh, psych psychologists call this kin psychology. So this is the simple fact that we have um, automatic inclinations to help those who we're genetically related to. So this is why parents love their children, why siblings are closer, why half-siblings are a little bit less close. Um, and so you can actually predict a whole bunch about human psychology by knowing about kin psychology. The second one, and this might not at first pass, well, maybe, maybe it will, but uh, seem like an important element of cooperation, but you'll see, see why it's so important, is pair bonding. So um, 
Other apes have a pair bonding psychology where a male and a female will come together for an extended period for the purposes of raising offspring, creates a deep emotional bond. And marriage is built upon this, of course, but marriage tries to extend the period in which you would normally stay together. Pair bonding uh, uh, extended across the life. Normally it wears after about four to seven years. Um, so that may explain uh, your experience. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, OK, so that's marriage. And that's going to turn out to be an important and useful thing for building institutions. Uh, next would be incest aversion. Like other primates, we have to avoid mating with siblings and parents, so we have an automatic, uh, reliably developing aversion, a disgust reaction to sex with siblings, uh, but that can be extended in something called an incest taboo, which is found in lots of different societies. And once you have incest taboos, you're organizing the society in particular ways. So a common thing would be to have a rule that says you have to marry some kinds of cousins, but other kinds of cousins are like brothers and sisters, so they're under the incest taboo. And this structures societies in ways that creates a sense of us. OK, now a third kind of psychology that evolved with the interactions of genes and culture is our interdependent psychology. So humans, unlike other species, have lots of social norms which require us to do things like food sharing or engage in mutual aid if someone gets hurt. Norms require that you help them or uh, cooperate in communal defense of the community. And this creates a fitness interdependence. So it matters for my well-being whether you survive. And that means I should care about you and worry about you and, and anybody else who helps you make sure you survive. And so we seem to be susceptible to certain cues that tell us that someone is part of our interdependent group or not part of our inter interdependent group. And then finally, and this is the one kind of referred to, uh, it's exploited by religion, but it's, the, it's our ethnic psychology. Um, racial differences can also tap it. But this evolves because groups, as they learn from each other, come to share certain norms. And those norms tend to be associated with superficial markings. So things like shared dialect, shared language, similar dress, similar greetings. And these superficial characteristics mark someone as someone likely to share my norms. And if they share my underlying norms, uh, then I'm uh, likely to have a successful interaction with them. I can cooperate them. I can predict their behavior. Um, so we just we share a lot of that. So you can show in experiments with babies that even babies are keying in and they preferentially interact and take toys with and learn from those who share mom's dialect. Even, this is even non-linguistic babies. So this is a piece of psychology that develops reliably and early. So these provide important anchors for, for cobbling up societies. Because one of the things we want to think about is how we went from relatively small-scale hunter-gatherers 12,000 years ago uh, into complex nation states of the modern world. So uh, mobile hunter-gatherers actually move around. So this is the, the social organization that dominated most of our species history going back at least a couple million years. But then 12,000 years ago, the origins of agriculture. And now to survive and compete in this world, you had to defend territory. So now we needed a very different kind of social structure than one where we're moving around and we're building long-distance ties with different groups. So what began to emerge are called kin-based institutions. So this took the basic raw material, the instincts that I mentioned before, and began to fashion them in ways that built increasingly intensely interconnected groups with lots of cross-cutting ties, marriage bonds, greater relatedness amongst groups. Uh, so these are called complex kin groups or intensive kin groups. One way you can see that is in the, the terms used for relatives. So in uh, 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 Western terminology for kin is actually is called Inuit terminology, which means it's like hunter-gatherers. And that should tell you something. Most other terminologies from agriculturalists will call certain other people besides your genetic father, father, and certain other people, mother. And you'll have brothers and sisters who are actually a type of cousin. And then, as I mentioned, you'll have other cousins you're supposed to marry. And that's where the incest taboos in. I mentioned how they affect who you marry. Now you're beginning to structure the group in certain ways. Uh, and uh, arranged marriage plays a role here. One of the strangest things is if we look across human societies, over half of all kinship systems are unilineal, which means we forget about half, like all of mom's relatives, and we focus just on dad's relatives. And this makes sense when you, once you realize you're eliminating conflicts of interest. So I have two cousins that are unrelated to each other, and I'm equally related to both of them. Now they have a conflict because they're not related to each other. But if you have a unilineal inheritance system, you eliminate those conflicts. So you're beginning to build a bounded group that can do stuff, corporately own land, share corporate responsibility. Um, and that's these other things. So to build interdependence, groups owned land uh, as a group, and they also shared responsibility. So if a member of your clan kills someone from another clan, 
you're all equally responsible, and they could kill any one of you in retribution. So you share, share communal guilt, interdependence. Along with this came powerful rituals. They're often um, high pageantry rituals. So uh, they involved in, uh, experiencing pain together as a group would be a typical one. And that causes, that taps our evolved psychology and creates bonds, and also the emergence of ancestor gods. These are just a few examples of the ways the cultural evolution has built more intertwined and interconnected groups. Uh, we mentioned sort of tribal and ethnic groups. Um, the way you create a tribe is you have marriage rules that say you can't marry outside, and then you create a bounded unit. So that, that's where tribes come from. Okay, so now the key distinction I'm getting to is during most of the course of human societal evolution, we've, uh, cultural evolution has built up interpersonal relationships uh, and ascribed group membership. So you're a member of the clan, you're a member of the tribe, creates interdependence, favors values about in-group loyalty, um, and about thinking yourself, about merging yourself with the larger group because your success really depends on your group and it doesn't depend that much on you. All right, so this has powered much of societal evolution. Now what we see in the modern world are impersonal interactions. Interactions trust in strangers, um, independence, uh, independent of religion or ethnic group, but based on principles, not relationships or identity. Um, now, this second set is, is based on social norms, so I'm going to show you some, some things that measure norms in a second, uh, but it, it's weakly tethered to our evolved psychology. So it's not built on kin psychology or our tribal psychology or things like that. So that's a bit of a problem. All right, now I just, so I'm going to show you variation and global variation in psychology that's a consequence of these kind of two broad characterizations I've made. Uh, I want to emphasize that these are two different virtues and that we're not, we're not dissing anyone for having different virtues. Uh, so in-group loyalty is good, helping your friends are good, taking care of your family is good, but sometimes that comes at a cost of being fair to strangers and treating others impartially. Um, you'll, you'll see that in some of the examples I'll use. All right, now in the, emer the emergence of state, so the, be the beginning of kind of state level uh, complexity, it's almost completely a family affair with the evolution of chiefdom, so hereditary rulership, until some societies began to build a thin layer of impersonal institutions. These were almost always military institutions. Militaries that promoted people based on merit tended to beat militaries that didn't, and so you got this emergence of this impersonal uh, state institutions. This applies even to, to, to uh, societies like Rome. So the Roman Senate is patrilineal clans. Okay, um, now, so most of human society states have been built on these webs of complex kinship that I've been talking about, clans with a corporate legal identity, no such thing as individual rights or anything like that. Uh, and European society gets built on simple kinship. And the simple idea that I'm going to lay out, um, you can find lots of historians who, who have made this case, it's, it's not my idea, uh, is that what happened in Europe, which is unique in human history, is that the, the, the Catholic Church, what became the Catholic Church, uh, dismantled the complex kinship system. They laid down a systematic program where they undermined clans, um, uh, had incest taboos which prevented cousin marriage, ended polygyny across European tribes. And you had to marry another Christian, so that dissolved the tribes, because you couldn't marry someone close to you, but you had to marry another Christian. So that's why there are no tribes in Europe. And you had this very particular uh, kind of kinship structure, which is now characterized in our language. And you can actually see this in the evolution of European languages. All right. Now, a lot of the psychological differences have to do with adapting to this world versus this world. All right. Now, um, as Europeans expanded, so after 1500, there's this big expansion of European societies around the world, you, formal European institutions get appear in various societies, and Ricardo was talking about some of that. Uh, but it's always over a system of complex kinship. Uh, so th that process is still unfolding as kind of urbanization cities begin to continue to tear apart these more traditional structures. Okay, now we wanted to, to, to try to measure this. So we went to an anthropological database called the Ethnographic Atlas, which gives us about 1,200 societies. And we created an index of this intensiveness of kinship. So do you have clans? Do you have bilateral inheritance? Do you have cousin marriage? And with that index, we can map the whole world at a subnational level. And so we can assign a value, how intensive is your kinship? And uh, my colleague here at Harvard, Ben Anke, did, did work similar to this, which t uh, arrives at the same story. We also got data on cousin marriage. And here we got actual rates of cousin marriage across the globe. So you can see those are global rates of cousin marriage there. All 
very common in Europe. So uh, the Catholic Church was selling dispensations for centuries because people were so desperate to marry their cousins. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to call this the marriage and family program. And that's this systematic effort by the Roman Catholic Church to eliminate all these kinship practices. All right, so simple measure of uh, in-group, out-group trust. So this is from the World Value Survey. We put together six questions, all the ones we could find on trust that's, that's specific about who you're trusting. So do you trust people you've met for the first time, people from another religion, or people from another nationality? We group that as out-group trust, take the average. Do you trust your family? Do you trust your neighbors? Do you trust people you know personally? Group that as an in-group trust measure, and then we subtract them. Now, uh, kind of a sanity check is everybody in the world trusts their in-group more than their out-group. So the, the question is, when do those things get closer together? When do people, uh, when does the out-group begin to approach the in-group? So that's a map of the world at, at the country level. All right. And so this is the measure of kinship intensity. So that's from our ethnographic anthropological atlas. That's our measure of actual cousin marriages in the mid-20th century. It's a log scale. And this is the duration of the church ban. So that's how long the church has been working on the various pieces of a population of a country. So we decomposed every country. We mapped them back to where they were in 1500. And then we assigned them a, a, how long that population has been exposed. So you can see there's strong relationships. More intensive kinship, uh, bigger difference between in-group and out-group trust. You know, that out-group is being distrusted relative to the family. More cousin marriage, same thing. And, but more time under the church, less difference between in-groups and out-groups. All right, so that's just a survey question, but maybe it doesn't capture anything important. So these are some of the experiments that Ricardo was talking about. This is called the public goods game. We give people, so this is university students around the world, a sum of real money, say 20 bucks. And we, we allow them to contribute to a common project as much as they want out of the 20. We increase it by 40%, and then we distribute it equally. So if you want to money maximize, you uh, don't put anything in the pot. You keep all your money, and then you get an equal share of whatever anybody else put in. If everybody's self-interested, nobody puts in, nothing increases, and we don't get any payments. Um, best thing for the group, everybody puts in, and we, we get the maximum payoff as a group. Players are anonymous in this game. They play it for 10 rounds. This is just the first round. There's, no, there's no, um, nothing under the rug here. I could show you the other rounds and would tell the same story. But I like the first round in the public goods game, because it's what people do before they know what the, everyone else is going to do. And what you see is more intensive kinship less willingness to cooperate in the public goods game. Same story with cousin marriage. Uh, the correlation there is 0.98. Uh, and um, same, same thing with more church exposure, more, co more uh, contributions to the public goods. Now, I didn't mention in the last slide, but we've also included the Eastern Church. One obvious question here, and we have various ways to deal with it, is maybe it's the supernatural beliefs, the belief in God that's doing some work here. But the Eastern Church never, they didn't have the program about <coughs> suppressing cousin marriage. They didn't have enthusiastic implementation of this. Uh, and so you don't see these effects with the Eastern Church, only with the Western Church. OK, um, now you might say, well, it's games in a laboratory, surveys. So this is data from across the world on voluntary, unpaid blood contributions, contributions to blood. So it's, it's helping everybody out. You get hit by a bus. You need blood. Um, you can get this blood. Um, so more intensive kinship, fewer blood donations. More cousin marriage, fewer blood donations. More time under the Western Church, more blood donations. All right. Now, that's cross-national data. I'll show you one fun one from within Italy. Italy has an interesting and complex history because the northern half of Italy was under the Carolinian Empire. So it received a full dosage of the church's marriage and family program. Southern Italy, well, so Sicily was under various Islamic powers. Uh, this was under the Eastern Orthodox. And so this is the uh, cousin marriage. So lots of cousin marriage down in southern Italy and Sicily. Not much cousin marriage in northern Italy, home of the Renaissance, whatnot. So uh, more cousin marriage, uh, fewer blood donations in Italy. All right. Passenger's dilemma. I always found this one kind of intuitive. Um, so a simple vignette experiment done around the world. We ask people, uh, so you're driving in a car and uh, you're, you're, you're a pedestrian in a car, and the driver is driving recklessly. He's your friend, and he hits someone. So someone's been killed, and his lawyer, so now there's going to be a court trial, says that if you're willing to lie in court under oath, then your friend will get off. But if you don't lie, um, then you know, he'll, he'll probably get some jail time. So the question is, will you lie? And you can see there's quite a bit of variation. 
from 90% of people saying help the friend to almost no one saying help the friend and you know you tell the truth in court. As you can see this is highly variable and uh, the same result. So greater kinship intensity, help the friend. Uh, more cousin marriage, help the friend. More time with the church, forget the friends. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is a measure of what uh, we're calling impartial honesty. So it's kind of a weird pro-sociality. So it's, um, uh, it's uh, honesty towards an uh, institution. So it's kind of like do you take office supplies and uh, you know, give them to your kids for Christmas or something from the office. So uh, your undergraduates all around the world are sent into a cubicle and they have to roll a die. And they roll the die privately look at it, they're by themselves, they put it in a computer, and then they're paid according to the die. So say, you know, one is the lowest, well, it's not the lowest, but it's $5, then $10, up to $25 for a five. If you roll a six, you get zero. So, and then, you know, it's, this is actually private, right? So we're not, we're not tricking the participants. But we, we know statistically what the distribution has to look like. So we can see at the country level um, how honest people are. Now, it's worth noting that this is the percentage of high claims. So if people are truthful, it would be 50-50. Um, and uh, you know, the higher you get up here, the more people are lying in order to, I guess, take home more money. So uh, the good news, kind of my sanity check again, is everybody lies. But it's just a matter of how much you lie. And you can see there's quite a, a variance here from about 60 to about 80, 80 percent. And this goes on with national level, national level measures of corruption. So again, we seem to be capturing something real. Okay, um, so same story here, uh, closely related to cousin, cousin marriage, kinship intensity, and, and church exposure. Uh, last one, um, this is actually my favorite. So this is from the period prior to 2002, when diplomats from all around the world would show up in New York City, and they were immune from parking tickets. So you could park anywhere, you could double park, and you just you could get a parking ticket, but you didn't have to pay it. And so you count up the number of tickets, you divide by the size of the diplomatic delegation, and you can show that people who come from countries with greater kinship intensity or more cousin marriage accumulated more parking tickets during this period, uh, and, the, and the usual measure with, uh, with church. So that's, kind of, that's supposed to go along with our laboratory experiment. All right. Now, I don't have time to get into, you know, we've done a zillion analyses in different ways within countries, comparing people within countries, comparing second generations, immigrants within countries. One of my favorite analyses is we track the diffusion of the church, which allows us to compare regions in different parts of uh, Europe. And just comparing regions within the same European country, we can detect the signature of the church. We can detect it in people's psychology, and we can detect it in the rates of cousin marriage in, in the 20th century. So you can, this is... This is the going through time here. OK, so key points for contemporary debates. All right, uh, what I've tried to uh, lay out here is that in understanding cooperation in the modern world, you have to understand that it's about two different kinds of cooperation. Uh, so one form is rooted in building personal relationships and tribal thinking that has been the foundation for complex human societies going all the way back. The other form is this impersonal prosociality, where you cooperate with strangers in a behavioral game, where you tell the truth for no reason when you're asked to roll a die and told to report it into a computer. Um, now, the, uh, the interpersonal relationships, oh, um, because the kinship uh, structures that I mentioned fit so well with our evolved psychology, they, they're really good at shaping us. And you can see that it, it continues to shape variation in the modern world even centuries after the institutions are dissolved. So that's one of the things that we, even after um, something like polygyny or cousin marriage is gone, we can still detect the effects of it. Because it just, just because the institutions, the values and the beliefs and the preferences all continue to be transmitted for a few generations. <coughs> all right, so in, in the, what led to the Industrial Revolution, in my view, in this book I've, I've, now, I've now written, uh, which is not out yet, but uh, it's in my computer, um, uh, the, the involved first the destruction and dismantling of all the usual stuff that allowed humans to cooperate in these cooperative groups. So the church end, ended arranged marriage, polygyny, cousin marriage, that dissolved the tribes. The church actually outlawed aesthetic rituals, no collective guilt, it's about you, it's about your sin, um, and clans. 
And so when people were unable to form these traditional cooperative units, the way they would normally bond together, they were forced into voluntary associations. So medieval guilds, med uh, monasteries, the voluntary associations where people would join, they had to swear an oath, and then those voluntary associations competed. And I think some of the magic of um, cooperation in the modern world comes from competition among groups. So you build these voluntary associations, and then you, uh, those compete. And that pushes up people's sociality, because they have to cooperate, whether it's their monastery, or it's their corporation, or you know, sports team. Uh, sports teams are a way of kind of one of our many tricks. All right, um, that's all.